Welcome to the Belly Button Window Channel and Episode 20, Part 2 of the Jimi Hendrix story like you've never heard it before. In this episode, we continue the deep dive into March of 1968 and the group's grueling U.S. tour. Please remember to check the channel's community tab and video information page where you will find links to related videos, performances and stunning photographs from the period. Friday the 8th of March 1968 sees the Jimi Hendrix Experience performing at Marvel Auditorium, Brown University, Providence, Rhode Island. Neville Chester's recorded in his diary. Arrived 6 p.m., had to wait to set gear, finally set up 8. Crowd came in, everyone drunk, a few fights, no cops. We told promoter group wouldn't play unless he got some security, he did. Did show, went down very well, Jimmy smashed an old white strat. Everybody went mad. Packed gear, very hard loading, finished 3.30, set off back to New York. Long and terrible drive. Got into New York 7. Got lost. Finally found hotel nearly 8. Drove 495 miles. Set list for the evening. Fire. Manic depression. The wind cries Mary. Hey Joe. Are you experienced? Red house. Little wing. Foxy lady. And purple haze. The following is an excerpt from a promotional piece appearing in the Brown University student newspaper titled Hendrix and Machine Will Open Your Minds. Be forewarned. Used to be an experience meant making you a bit older. This one makes you wider. The Jimi Hendrix experience is coming. What you'll learn from hearing him play won't be anything you've learned before. He pushes your mind farther out than it's ever gone and softly into a vague purple just on the edge of unconsciousness. Hendrix is loud music, loud and terrifying and beautiful. Play him 78 and he says funny things. Play him 33 and he explodes. Well, I know. I know you'll probably scream and cry that your little world won't let you go. But have you ever been experienced? Anyone who has, has already bought a ticket. The rest of you, go and have your heads opened. The following review by Prescott Green appeared in the Brown Daily Herald. Witness Marvel Jim. Poor lighting, deafening, echoing acoustics. Only part of the room suitable for seeing or hearing or both. But also witness crowd reaction, satisfaction. Hendrix was able to transcend the difficulties and deliver a performance which was able to please his devotees and win over the casual listener. Hendrix is hard to fathom. He writes all his own music and lyrics, the lyrics being extremely provocative, the music tending towards the refraction of these lyrics. But then he combines this genuine art with stage antics, which range from suggestive buffoonery to frightening displays of angered, frustrated confusion. A few of his selections were Purple Haze, Foxy Lady, and Manic Depression. There was also a medley containing a disrespectful Pledge of Allegiance during which the audience was asked to stand. The experience closed with an improvisation, which ended with Hendrix smashing his guitar in a fury. Love or Confusion is the title of one of his songs. Moreover, I think it is the theme of one of his performances, and further still, it is Jimi Hendrix's theme, message, bag and existence, which subjective though it may be, is difficult not to appreciate. Another Marvel Auditorium Review this time by Marilyn McNair. The auditorium, looking remarkably like a gymnasium, was filling up fast. A group on stage was playing something conventionally unconventional, very well. The sound system was off, vocal virtually non-existent. Part of the crowd was upset. Part of the crowd was teeny bopper. Part of the crowd had come for a mixer. Everyone was waiting. And then, substantially later, there stood Jimi Hendrix in bright green pants and a blinding flowered shirt, looking and sounding experienced what could be heard, and then substantially duller, there sat the crowd in its sub-semi-pseudo-quasi-plastic hippie mass, looking and sounding confused, and all true lovers of Jimi Hendrix despaired the existence of that sacred institution, the Brown University concert mixer, and watched the myth breaking. But Hendrix was playing for those who had come to hear his music, his guitar was himself and he was fantastic, surmounting great obstacles, Foxy Lady exploded, I don't live today hoping he didn't, was truly fine. Then there was some excellent uncommercial blues, substantially unappreciated. The frustration, however, was beginning to show. Trying to be polite, Hendrix announced the end of the concert. Trying to be turned on, the audience stampeded the exits. Hendrix began playing Wild Thing, sarcastically, and the experienced realizing laughed with him, as the brunt of the joke wafted its unperceptive body euphorically through the doors. But finally, the humor turned to sadness, and in frustration Hendrix destroyed the evening symbolically, and his guitar literally, 
What was it? A concert? A mixer? A general high school convention? Hoping the sophomore class made a lot of money, one respectfully requests the initiation of university-only concerts for artists of the status of Jimi Hendrix, and whatever are we going to do spring weekend? Saturday, the 9th of March, and the group performs at the State University of New York, Stony Brook, Long Island, New York. Partial set list for the show, Red House, I Don't Live Today, Purple Haze, and Wild Thing. At the end of the show, Jimmy tries and succeeds in stopping time by throwing his guitar at the gym clock. Also, on March 9th, Jimi Hendrix appears on the cover of The Rolling Stone. Around this time, though the actual date is disputed, one morning in the second week of March, Hendrix was evicted from the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Apparently, Jimmy had thrown a party in honor of Michael Bloomfield, guitarist with the electric flag who were in New York for an 11-day stay at the Café O Go Go, which lasted from March 7th to March 17th. The following is a review of the New York State performance, by Stephen Levine, which appeared in The Statesman. The machine had a startling feature and a different type of arranging that most other bands have not exhibited. The drummer for the machine wore no shirt. Actually, there could have been a very practical reason for this. Drummers sweat, and why ruin a good shirt? Noel Redding provided a bass that was not heard. It was felt, starting from the shoes and working its way up to the knot in one's tie or cape. Mitch Mitchell never once followed the beat, but rather... He made his own up and hoped that it fit in. No, he made his own up and didn't give a damn. However, the people paid up to five dollars a ticket. Not to see those two alone, but to see them with the man. First of all, let me say that aside from his artistic talent, Hendrix is a master showman. He knew the tricks the people want to see, and he gave them the things they desired. To look only at the showmanship would be a crime of omission, and this I will not commit. The talent was there for all to see and hear. In Red House Blues, Hendrix exhibited a style rivaled only by that of the best blues guitarists. There was total emotion of the piece. One could feel how sad he felt about losing his woman. Everyone remembers Wild Thing. No, you do not. Hendrix lent an interpretation to this song that has never been rivaled. The instrumentation was fantastic and the vocal just right. The only pity was that it finished up the concert. As he ended the number, Hendrix was mobbed by those in the front rows in a display that was a clear expression of love. In keeping with the heifer tradition, the evening wasn't necessarily stoned, but beautiful. Sunday, the 10th of March, and the experience performs two shows at the International Ballroom, Hilton Hotel, Washington, District of Columbia. Road manager Neville Chesters records in his travel diary that Jimmy is now staying at the Shoreham Hotel in New York City. Set list for first show, Killing Floor, Foxy Lady. The Wind Cries Mary, Fire, Red House, I Don't Live Today, Purple Haze, and Wild Thing. And for the second show, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, Hey Joe, Fire, The Wind Cries Mary, Foxy Lady, Red House, I Don't Live Today, Purple Haze, and Wild Thing. The following is a retrospective look at the Washington Hilton gig, which was published 2012 in the Washington Post, titled Jimi Hendrix Experience. Washington Hilton, 1968. Jimi Hendrix played the Washington Hilton on Connecticut Avenue, N.W., the same one where Hinckley shot Reagan in 1981. That's right, the guitar god himself played to 4,000 fans in the hotel's International Ballroom on March 10, 1968, accompanied by his bandmates, Noel Redding bass and Mitch Mitchell drums. Now, this one might be cooler than the Beatles playing D.C. in 1964, but I don't want to spark a giant musical debate. They're both awesome finds. Jim Hoagland, winner of two Pulitzers, wrote an interesting review of the show the next day in the Washington Post. Here are a few excerpts. Hendrix and his two side men are making their first American tour since becoming England's most popular rock group. Part of yesterday's crowd was composed of two plane loads of his fans from New York, who were shut out of his sellout shows there last week. He is, in short, the hottest thing going. The 22-year-old guitarist and vocalist who was born in Seattle became an instant legend in junior high school classrooms when, in a moment of crowd hysteria, he burned his guitar at the Monterey Pop Festival. The question kept circulating yesterday in anguished tones. Is he going to burn it? He didn't. But he didn't disappoint the crowd either, with his wildly sexual gyrations and to-hell-with-it attitude. He is bad, and teenagers love him for it. He is more evil than Elvis ever dreamed of being and teenagers know that it infuriates their parents. Monday the 11th of March, 
Neville Chester's records, there was a row with Jimmy for refusing to set up the experience equipment for the band soft machine. Tuesday, the 12th of March at the Scene Club, New York City and Hendrix has a jam session with Jim Morrison, Buddy Miles and members of the McCoys. Then Wednesday, the 13th of March, Sound Center Studios, New York City. Recording, somewhere. My Friend and 1983 with Robert Wyatt of Soft Machine. Also, while in New York, Jimmy and Noel are interviewed, including a telephone interview conducted by Jane Scott for The Plain Dealer, published March 15, 1968. Actually, the group of musicians who joined Hendrix on this date at the Sound Center Studios had the privilege of having Jimmy in the role of producer, as Chaz Chandler was not present. With engineers, Vincent J. Gagliano, Tom Muccio, Angel Sandoval, Lenny Steyer, and musicians, Jimi Hendrix, vocals, guitar, and bass, Noel Redding, vocals, guitar, and bass, Ken Fine, 12-string guitar, Paul Caruso, harmonica, Stephen Stills, piano, Jimmy Mays, drums, he played with Hendrix during the days of Joey D and the Starlighters, and Buddy Miles, drums. Thursday the 14th of March, and a second day at New York Sound Center. Also, there is a press reception for Soft Machine that takes place at the Scene Club in New York. Noel Redding, Chaz Chandler, Michael Jeffrey and Neville Chesters are all in attendance. While also that day, an interview takes place by telephone with Jimmy, conducted by Pete Goodman for Beat Instrumental, publication May 1968. Friday, March 15, 1968, Atwood Hall, Clark University, Worcester, and the band performs two shows in front of 600 students in a small college in Massachusetts. Noel recalled, In Worcester, we were filmed by the BBC, an inhibiting intrusion, self-consciousness crept in when we were being filmed or recorded, a stiffness that kept us restrained musically and physically. Set list for the first show, Are You Experienced? Fire, Star Spangled Banner, Hey Joe, Foxy Lady, Fire. As Noel pointed out, the Jimmy and the experience are filmed and recorded for the show. BBC TV, All My Loving Broadcast, 3rd of November 1968. But perhaps most importantly, the highlight of the day was that Jimmy is elected Instrumentalist of the World by Hit Week magazine in the Netherlands. Clark Uni remembered, to commemorate the 55th anniversary of the Clark Uni performance, many of those fortunate to witness the shows shared their parting thoughts and memories of that fateful day. By Craig S. Seaman, armed with a sunburst Fender Stratocaster and later in the night, a dark-coloured Strat, Hendrix proceeded to scorch his fretboard and shoot off big, sludgy riffs as crashing drums and locomotive bass lines collided alongside him. All this created a trippy cacophony of fuzzed-out melodies and cosmic songs of pure psychedelic splendor that included Fire, Hey Joe, Foxy Lady, Purple Haze, Red House, Wild Thing, and Are You Experienced? Declared the Black Elvis and Wild Man of Borneo, less than a year earlier by the British press. Hendrix came barreling out on Clark's Atwood Hall stage, wearing a black suede hat with a metallic ring band around its brim, a frilly white shirt, psychedelic paisley vest, bell bottoms and black leather Chelsea boots. As the chair of Clark's Social Affairs Board, Robert Echter, then 21, had the foresight to book up-and-coming artists before they became hefty-priced, hard-to-get rock stars. Echter was not only responsible for bringing the Jimi Hendrix experience to Clark University, he picked up Hendrix and his bandmates at the old Holiday Inn in Worcester and drove them to the campus. Getting the Jimi Hendrix experience was a major coup for Clark. When Hendrix played Worcester, he got paid $2,500 for the first show and an additional $1,500 for the second show, which he played immediately after Ector said. To get the band to Atwood Hall, Ector picked up Hendrix and his fellow bandmates, drummer Mitch Mitchell and bassist Noel Redding, at the old Holiday Inn that once stood on Southbridge Street. I had rented a little compact car on one of them, I forget it was Mitch Mitchell, or Noel Redding, who said he wanted to drive. So I let him drive, and Jimmy and I sat in the back seat together, Hector said. Hendrix was a really nice guy. He really was real decent. He was calm, cool, relaxed. He wasn't excessive in any way I recall. He was casually professional. Tickets for the 8pm performance sold out solely among Clark students. A second show was added at 10.30 p.m. the same night, with tickets going on sale the day before. Because of technical problems with the sound system, Hendrix was delayed close to three hours. Award-winning British documentarian Tony Palmer shot footage of the Jimi Hendrix experience performing at Clark University for Palmer's film All My Loving. 
a BBC documentary focusing on the rock and roll explosion during the Vietnam War era, All My Loving Features, live performances from The Animals, Cream, Pink Floyd and The Who, for starters, and interviews with Eric Burden, Eric Clapton, John Lennon, Paul McCartney and Pete Townshend. Palmer said it was absolutely essential to include the American guitarist in a BBC documentary, despite the rock doc primarily focusing on British artists. It was Eric Clapton who told me that, in his view, Jimmy was the most remarkable guitar player he's come across, Palmer said. Equipped with an Ariflex movie camera, Palmer and his four-man film crew tracked Hendrix down in Worcester. Interviewing the iconic rocker after the Clark concerts for the BBC documentary, Palmer found that Hendrix was nothing like the fearsome reputation that preceded him. I was completely taken aback because, all right, Hendrix was tired after the concert, but he was so polite and so almost embarrassed to be interviewed and very gentle, and he said some very interesting things in the film, Palmer recalled. Jimmy kept saying, I can't express myself in any conversation. When we're on stage, that's your whole life. Of course, that was a real cue for me, because I believe that of many of the rock and roll stars that I knew would all say, they were not too good with words. But when you get them on stage, they're talking through their music. Palmer is convinced that Hendrix was stoned free and not high when he performed at Clark University. In fact, early in the evening, a fan offered Hendrix a hit from a joint, but the rock star refused. That's Eric Clapton's line, Palmer said. You couldn't do what we did in Cream without being absolutely stone-cold sober. Looking back 55 years later, Palmer has nothing but praise for the legendary guitarist's performance in Worcester. I thought Hendrix was mesmerizing, absolutely mesmerizing. I think the best way to describe it, it just exploded at you, Palmer said. I wasn't prepared for this explosion of energy and his display of pyrotechnics on the guitar. It just hit you. It was kind of like a visceral attack almost, but not a kind of crude turn up the volume attack. There didn't seem to be anything that Jimmy couldn't make the guitar do. You just sat there with your jaw opened because he was absolutely wonderful. However, local press didn't share Palmer's praise. Hendrix is the 22-year-old American who could only make it as a backup musician with rock groups here until he went to England in 1966 and became the Yankee Doodle Boy of British rock and recordings, Jack Tubert wrote the next morning in the Worcester Telegram. Don't mince words, Jack. What did you really think about Hendrix? And by the way, Hendrix was 24, not 22 when he played Clark. With the headline, Hendrix's frustrating experience, followed by the sub-headline, Rock Singer a Little Late. Tubert wrote that as 10.30 p.m. rolled along, some of the ticket holders were pushing to get out and get their money back, which sounds almost ridiculous today. Not just because Hendrix was easily the most electrifying performer of the day, but because tickets were only $3, $3.50 and $4, about $1.25, $1.32 in today's dollars, with Clark University students receiving a dollar off, and it was a Friday night. Tubert apparently didn't stay for the show. In his piece, Tubert carried on in great lengths that Hendrix was tardy, but he doesn't say a lick, good or bad, about Hendrix's guitar playing, stage presence or sheer volume. Hendrix, too, wasn't happy with the first show at Clark. It was the first time we ever used that PA, you know. It was the first time we ever used it, and it completely went out, Hendrix told Palmer in a recorded interview with the BBC immediately after the first show. We didn't get any chance to sing really decent. It really was a drag because I couldn't hear myself sing, plus I couldn't get in tune so good. But we still have one more show to go, so we'll be all right. Clark University Junior. David Dronsick was kinder to Hendrix in the review he wrote for the university's student newspaper, The Scarlet, in a review published April 5, 1968. But Dronsick also had his share of criticism. If you were at the first show, you could not hear Hendrix's voice. So you sang along to yourself, but that got boring. And then in Foxy Lady, in which you could hear only the two words of the title, when the drums and guitars were silent, you knew that this was not the experience for which you had paid for, Dronsick wrote. There was a lot of excitement leading up to the event. And then there was a huge letdown, because there was this big, big delay to get the thing going, because the equipment didn't show up, Dronsick said this week. As a result, the first show was pretty lousy. The sound was poor, and people were somewhat disappointed calling the second show an experience for the audience from beginning to end, Dronsick said. Not only was the later show so much better than the first, the two shows were also so different that they cannot be compared. When the curtain opened for Hendrix, the audience went wild. This was a Hendrix audience. He recognized this fact, and he gave them a real show. 
Dronsick wrote in The Scarlet. Hendrix did everything possible with his guitar and got fantastic responses from it whether he played it with his fingers, his teeth, or his what-have-you. In an interview for this article, Dronsick said, The second show was terrific. Dronsick added, Hendrix did a little theatre as if he was going to do something with a lighter and a guitar at one point, but it was just sort of sleight of hand. He and his guitar did, pardon the expression, hump the amplifier a couple of times. In addition to not lighting his guitar on fire, Hendrix did not smash his guitar either, even though one friendly and now familiar female fan in the front row asked him if he would. A Clark University junior, Robert Marshall, shot a series of iconic photos of Hendrix. Robert Marshall's photographs of Jimi Hendrix performing on March 15, 1968, at Clark University's Atwood Hall were published in the Clark Scarlet newspaper. It's by far the greatest accomplishment of my life, Marshall said about photographing Hendrix, and the crazy thing, it was just all luck. Armed with a Konica camera and several rolls of 35mm film, Marshall shot 100 photos of Hendrix that night. Because of the BBC film crew set up lights, Marshall didn't need to use a flash. For the multiple image stills of Hendrix, Marshall used split prism lenses. I had a beginner's camera. It wasn't a single lens reflex camera. It didn't have a zoom feature, Morgan recalled. I had to get really close to Hendrix's face to get those close-ups, and he was really, really friendly and fine about that. Not only did some of his stellar Hendrix photos make it in the Scarlet and Clark's 1968 yearbook, Marshall was approached by Jimi Hendrix's estate for the use of some of his photos for Dagger Records' official bootleg Live at Clark University, released in 1999. Marshall said Hendrix was very professional, apologetic about the delay, and approachable. I remember somebody saying to Jimi Hendrix, we're ordering a pizza. What do you want on your pizza? Marshall recalled. I don't remember what Hendrix said, but that's how informal it was. We couldn't hear too well for a couple of days after, but the show was so amazing that it didn't matter, Morgan said. Hendrix played behind his back, he played with his teeth, and he had all kinds of pedals and buttons and levers he would push, but it wasn't just crazy. It was somehow in harmony with each other, and Hendrix seemed to be doing two or three things at the same time, playing chords and melodies with the notes at the same time. Nobody had ever heard anything like it. My major memory of the Hendrix shows was that they were so loud that I had to walk out of Atwood Hall and back up to the lobby with the doors closed before I could actually hear what they were playing. Clark University Jr. and later Worcester Magazine editor Walter Crockett said, It was that loud, and there was so much feedback going on. I never heard anything that loud. I remember feeling bad that it was just so expletive loud for me, pardon the expression, that I couldn't really get into it very much. Web Disc Jockey Jeff Starr was at the Hendrix concert in conjunction with Clark University. The popular radio personality was giving updates on the expected arrival of Hendrix in Atwood Hall. I think you appreciated Hendrix more after it was over because you don't realize how big Hendrix was, what a star he was and how talented he was, Starr said. Starr said, I've seen hundreds of people perform. Hendrix has to be in my top five because he was a truly great guitarist and he was a truly great performer. Before ending the night with an explosive, wild thing, Hendrix told the crowd, Thank you very much for showing up tonight and staying with us this long. I hope we get a chance to come back again. That concludes this installment of the series. Stay tuned for the next episode, where we will continue the deep dive into March of 1968 of the Hendrix story and the band's US tour. Don't forget to subscribe for future content updates. And by the way, if you have any stories, anecdotes, Oregon pictures to contribute, we would love to hear from you.